Hello and a very good evening. You're watching the news at 6 on Rajya Sabha Television with me, Frank Pereira. Here are the headlines. Terrorists abduct and kill army officer in Shopia district of Jammu and Kashmir. Lieutenant Tumir Fayaz was found with multiple bullet injuries. Kulbushan Jadav's death sentence stayed by the International Court of Justice. India accuses Pakistan of violations of the Vienna Conventions in its complaint to the ICJ. Supreme Court takes its first step towards going paperless with the Prime Minister launching the integrated case management system, system expected to help litigants access data online easily. Markets hit their all-time highs on predictions of 100% monsoon by the IMD. Nifty crosses 9,400 for the first time even as the BSE Sensex closes above 30,000 points. And over a decade of conservative rule ends in South Korea as liberal Moon Jae-in is sworn in as the President Moon expected to improve ties with North Korea. But in a shocking incident, the body of an army lieutenant was found with multiple bullet injuries in Shopia district in Kashmir on Wednesday. The army officer, identified as Lieutenant Umar Fayaz, uh, was uh, abducted and killed by terrorists in Shopia, where he had gone to attend a family wedding. Defence Minister Arun Jaitley and Jammu and Kashmir Chief Minister Mehbooba Mufti strongly condemned the killing. An army officer from Kashmir was abducted and shot dead by terrorists in Shopia district on Tuesday night. 22-year-old Lieutenant Umer Fayaz was on leave to attend his cousin's wedding in Batapura when he was kidnapped and killed. His bullet-riddled body was found in her main area of Shopia this morning. This was a, a very dastardly and an act of cowardice. This was a unknown terrorist who is in कल रात को लेफ्टिनेंट उमर फयाज को किडनैप किया है और बाद में उनको मार दिया गया है इंडियन आर्मी इस दुख की घड़ी में इस फैमिली के साथ खड़ी है लेफ्टिनेंट फयाज वाज पोस्टेड विद टू राजपूताना राइफल्स इन अखनूर सेक्टर इन जम्मू ही वाज कमिशनड इन द आर्मी इन दिसंबर लास्ट ईयर ही वाज आल्सो एन एक्सेप्शनल स्पोर्ट्समैन एंड वाज टिप टू परस्यू द यंग ऑफिसर्स इज कोर्स इन सितंबर the officer was laid to rest with full military honours in his native village in Kulgam on Wednesday. Defence Minister Arun Jaitley strongly condemned the killing, calling it a dastardly act of cowardice. He also said that the young officer was a role model and that his sacrifice reiterated the nation's commitment to eliminate terrorism from the valley. The gruesome killing was also condemned by Jammu and Kashmir Chief Minister Mehbooba Mufti as well as members of other political parties. The opposition parties, however, insisted that a political solution was required to solve the issue. It's a very barbaric, a very cowardly act. And in the state government and central government, which is a political vacuum, which is an atmosphere of re-emergence of militancy, political killings have started from the beginning, इलेक्शंस कैंसल होने लगे हैं उससे वो वायलेंट कंस्टिट्यूएंसी जो एम्बोल्डन हो गई है पूरी पार्टियां पूरा देश सरकार के साथ खड़ा है अगर वो पाकिस्तान को कोई मुंहतोड़ जवाब देने की इच्छा रखते हैं तो उनको काम करना चाहिए और आज भी जो खबर आज मिली है बड़ा दुख हम लोगों को है कि इस प्रकार से किडनैप करके हमारे अफसरों को मारा जा रहा है तो इससे लोगों का मनोबल टूटता है आई स्ट्रांगली कंडम दिस किलिंग एंड वायलेंस इज नॉट द आंसर एंड that to targeting individual officers or jawans and uh, killing them will not take uh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir anywhere. And uh, we should address the issues as political issues. The incident comes amidst rising tensions between civilians and security forces in the valley. There has been a spike in militant activities in South Kashmir's districts of Pulawama, Shopia, Anantnag and Kulgam. Meanwhile, the army on Wednesday foiled yet another infiltration bid by militants along the line of control in Baramula district of Kashmir. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Well, the International Court of Justice has stayed the execution of Indian national Kulbushan Jada, who was sentenced to death by a Pakistani military court on charges of spying. The order by the Hague-based court came a day after India approached it against the death sentence, accusing Islamabad of... Uh, 
egregious uh, violations of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. In its appeal to the ICJ, India also asserted that Jadav was kidnapped from Iran where he was involved in business activities after retiring from the Indian Navy. India said it made 16 requests for consular access to Jadav but uh, there was no response from Pakistan. Islamabad also did not respond to India's request for papers relating to Jadav's case. 46-year-old Jadav was sentenced to death last month by a military court in Pakistan for alleged espionage. Senior advocate Harish Salve will argue Jadav's case in the International Court of Justice where it opens on May 15th. Why have we chosen this course of action? I have told you the circumstances, but the implications when again, it's a conjectural question, uh, frankly speaking. Uh, I have mentioned to you very clearly that the circumstances that existed, the life of an Indian citizen is a threat. We have been denied consular access, which is in contravention to uh, to, to the international law, and therefore we have sought this sought this course of action. Uh, it is a very carefully considered decision. It is a decision taken by the government in the interest of an Indian citizen. Pakistan, without स्केपबोर्ड बना रही थी उसके ऊपर एक बहुत बड़ा झटका इसके कारण लगा है और मैं मानता हूं कि भारत सरकार की ये और भारत देश की ये बहुत बड़ी विजय है दिस काइंड ऑफ एग्जीक्यूशन ऑर्डर्स आर बीइंग पास्ड बाय पाकिस्तान द फैक्ट दैट द इंडियन मिनिस्ट्री फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम वेंट आफ्टर ऑलमोस्ट 45 इयर्स टू सीक सच अ स्टे ऑफ एग्जीक्यूशन एंड द फैक्ट दैट द इंटरनेशनल कोर्ट ऑफ जस्टिस हैज डीम्ड इट फिट टू ग्रांट स्टे ऑब्वियसली फाइंडिंग अ प्राइमा फेसी केस इन फेवर ऑफ इंडिया and India's argument that uh, all these execution orders have not met the consular requirements. So I think we are very hopeful of uh, future course of action. Well, Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Wednesday launched the integrated case management system of the Supreme Court in the presence of uh, Chief Justice of India, Jagdish Singh Keher. Now the system will help litigants access data and retrieve information online. The new system will be a step towards making the proceedings of the Supreme Court paperless. Speaking on the occasion, uh, Keher said that he proposes to integrate the system with all 24 high courts and subordinate courts across the country. He further added that it will help usher transparency, reduce manipulation and help the litigant to know about the progress of the case on a real-time basis. Every central and state government department will know if they have been made a party to the case and it will help them prepare accordingly. The Prime Minister used the tagline, Nation is changing to the point of changing mindsets with regard to work culture in the country. I have heard many places that are coming in a lot of big amounts. In the High Court, in the Supreme Court, the judges have reduced their vacation and have reduced their time for the country. I am very proud of you for this. Thank you. क्वांटम के रूप में इसका परिणाम क्या आता है वो अलग बात है लेकिन इस प्रकार का भाव पूरे वातावरण को बदल देता है एक सेंस ऑफ रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी को बल देता है well, the Nifty crossed the 9,400 level for the first time on Wednesday, while the Sensex surged uh, to its lifetime high of 30,246.28 in the late afternoon trade. This rise uh, came on widespread buying spurred by forecast of a normal monsoon this year. BSE Sensex gained 1.05% or 314.92 points to close at 30,248.17, while the NSE Nifty gained 0.97% to close at 9,407.30. Well, brokers said that uh, sentiment was upbeat after the Indian uh, Meteorological Department uh, said that monsoon could be normal this year and bring 100% rainfall instead of 96% as predicted earlier, which is expected to give a booster dose to the rural economy. And moving on now, Russian Deputy Prime Minister Dmitry Rogozin uh, arrived in the national capital on Wednesday for a one-day visit. He met External Affairs Minister Shishma Swaraj, with both sides reviewing their bilateral cooperation in a range of sectors including civil nuclear trade and investments. This meeting...
comes ahead of the annual summit between Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Russian President Vladimir Putin on June 1st. During the meeting of India-Russia Intergovernmental Commission on Trade, Economic and Cultural Cooperation, both sides also took stock of implementation of various key bilateral initiatives. Russian Deputy Prime Minister later met Prime Minister Narendra Modi and discussed issues of bilateral interest. Prime Minister Modi noted that uh, the positive all-round progress in bilateral cooperation between India and Russia. He also appreciated the high-level exchanges between the two sides as both countries celebrate the 70th anniversary of establishment of diplomatic relations this year. Сегодняшняя наша встреча в основном была посвящена обсуждению вопросов торгово-экономического сотрудничества, а также подготовке к саммиту, который состоится вот уже совсем скоро, в самом начале июня этого года в Санкт-Петербурге состоится встреча наших лидеров, премьер-министра господина Моди и президента Путина. We agreed to work closely in the months ahead to take forward many of the collaborative ideas that emerged in diverse fields, including security, nuclear, space, disaster management, trade and economy, science and technology, and people-to-people -people linkages. Well, here's a look now at what else is making news across the country and nationwide. The BSP has expelled its legislator Nasimuddin Siddiqui and his son from the party for carrying out anti-party activities. The party has accused Nasimuddin of accepting money from people in return for work. The party further added that it will not tolerate such indiscipline. Suspended AAP MLA Kapil Mishra began his hunger strike over the party not disclosing details of funding for foreign tours of its leaders. Mishra on Tuesday lodged three FIRs against Kejriwal and other party leaders with the CBI in connection with various corruption charges against them. Delhi Metro authorities have announced a two-phase hike in passenger fares starting Wednesday. A metro rushed nearly double now. The new minimum fare will be 10 rupees while the maximum would be 50 rupees. Tariff would rise uh, further from October 1st when the maximum will go up to 60 rupees. Heat wave conditions continue to prevail across several states in the country. Sweltering weather conditions continue to affect our normal life in, uh, in Delhi, Madhya Pradesh, Charkhand, Odisha, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Punjab and Haryana. In the national capital, the mercury touched 44 degrees Celsius in some parts of the city. It's time for a short break now, but news and updates will continue on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. लड़ाई इस समय ऑपोजिशन और सरकार के बीच में क्या है क्या आइडियोलॉजी की लड़ाई है क्या मुद्दों की लड़ाई है संविधान खतरे में इससे बड़ा मुद्दा क्या हो सकता है ऑपोजिशन एक प्लेटफॉर्म पर जब आएगा और बहुत सारे ऐसे फेसेस होंगे तो ये बातें बहुत आम हो जाती हैं कि ईगो क्लैशेस होती हैं और अल्टीमेटली वो जो ऑपोजिशन प्लेटफॉर्म बनता है वो क्रम्बल कर जाता है ऑपोजिशन में एकता पहले होना जरूरी है जो नाम आप कह रहे हैं नाम सेकेंडरी बात है Watch to the point with veteran JDU leader Sharad Yadav only on Rajya Sabha Television. Raju Ki Bauli, located in Meheroli, is considered the most ornamental of Baulis in the national capital. It was built by Dalat Khan during the reign of Sekandar Lodi in 1516. Rajon refers to masons who used it. The entire structure is subterranean. So only the topmost story is visible as the visitor approaches. Walk towards its steps and each lower level slowly reveals itself. The top floor has a row of arched niches. There are three levels going down with 66 steps. The Bauli complex has a 12-pillar tomb and a mosque with plaster decoration on it. Carved brackets support the chajja below the parapet. There are rooms behind this arcade, meant for shade and shelter for visitors. 
The Bauli combines Islamic architecture with hints of Hindu engravings and geometric designs. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, South Korea's new president, Moon Jae-in, has advocated closer ties with neighboring North Korea in a sign of a break with the hardline approach of his predecessors. Moon expressed his willingness to even go to North Korea to meet Kim Jong-un if it meant bringing lasting peace to the peninsula. Moon also vowed to improve his country's ties with the longtime ally, the U.S. But his adverse views on the deployment of the THAAD anti-missile system has put a question mark over South Korea-U.S. ties. Seoul's policy on North Korea is about to get a major overhaul. In his first speech after being sworn in, South Korea's new president, Moon Jae-in, vowed to improve relations with the North, saying he would be willing to visit Pyongyang under the right circumstances. Moon took oath of office in Seoul's National Assembly a day after his decisive win in the election that was called to replace impeached President Park Geun-hye. The election took place in the backdrop of rising tensions in the Korean Peninsula over North Korea's missile and nuclear program and the subsequent South Korea-U.S. military drills and the deployment of controversial U.S. anti-missile system, THAAD. While Moon has been vocal about his criticism of THAAD, he also talked about further strengthening the alliance with the United States. The However, Moon is unlikely to get a long honeymoon when it comes to North Korea. Experts have been predicting an imminent nuclear test, North Korea's sixth, for weeks now. Under these circumstances, a keen eye would be on how Moon applies the sunshine policy of the Liberal governments of 1998 to 2008 that advocated closer ties between the two Koreas. A key challenge for Moon would also be his handling of ties with China, which retaliated economically over the deployment of THAAD. Apart from handling ties with North Korea, the 64-year-old Democratic Party candidate has also promised to tackle corruption, bolster the economy and address youth unemployment, some of the key concerns for voters. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, in an unpredictable move, the U.S. President Donald Trump has fired the director of the FBI, James Comey, saying he was unable to effectively lead the Bureau. But Democrats say that he was fired because the FBI was investigating alleged links between the Trump campaign and Russia. Experts say Comey tried to strike a balance in a sharply divided political environment and ended up alienating both sides. It has been termed as U.S. President Donald Trump's most unpredictable move, firing FBI Director James Comey over his handling of the inquiry into Hillary Clinton's emails. Interestingly, Comey got to know about his termination watching the news on television. White House says Trump's decision came after Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein assessed the situation at the FBI and concluded that Comey had lost his confidence. The termination caps a difficult year for Comey, whose handling of the Hillary Clinton email investigation drew scrutiny from both sides of the aisle. You have a system that's working. You have a career prosecutor that lost confidence in the FBI director's ability uh, to carry out his responsibilities. An FBI director who is, who is equally um, questioned by numerous folks on the left who all said that they had a problem. The sudden termination has perplexed not just Comey, but everyone else too. It is noteworthy that last year in July, Comey had declared that investigation into Hillary Clinton's emails should be closed. But just 11 days before the presidential election, the investigation had been reopened. It was a decision Democrats believe caused Clinton victory.
Democrats are now suggesting that fiery Comey is a sinister design by Trump to influence inquiry into whether members of the Trump election campaign colluded with Russia. We know the House is investigating Russian interference in our elections that benefited the Trump campaign. We know the Senate is investigating. We know the FBI has been looking into whether the Trump campaign colluded with the Russians, a very serious offense. Were these investigations getting too close to home for the president? Democrats are also calling the move a Nixonian, comparing it to President Nixon's infamous decision to purge the Justice Department during the Watergate investigation. The White House said the search for a successor would begin immediately. It is only the second time the head of the FBI has been fired. The last U.S. president to fire FBI director was Bill Clinton, who dismissed William Sessions in 1993 over financial irregularities. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, here's a roundup of the other international news and global buzz. Hundreds of supporters of Jakarta's governor Basuki Purnama gathered around City Hall signing the national anthem and calling for him to be freed after a court sentenced him to two years in jail for blasphemy. President Joko Widodo was an ally of Purnama and the verdict will be a setback for a government that has sought to quell radical groups and soothe investors' concerns that the country's secular values were at risk. Despite fierce opposition from NATO ally Turkey, US President Donald Trump has approved supplying arms to Kurdish YPG fighters to support an operation to retake the Syrian city of Raqqa from Islamic State. The US has long supplied arms to the Arab components of the Syrian Democratic Forces, which include YPG fighters. Turkey has objected to such a move, raising fears of a backlash that could prompt the Turks to curtail their cooperation with Washington in the struggle against the Islamic State. Cambodia's uh, Premier Hun Sen has uh, warned that he will not hesitate using military might if protests turn violent. Hun Sen is preparing for local polls in June and a 2018 national election after clamping down on opposition figures trying to break his 32-year grip on power. Reportedly, more than a dozen activists and opposition politicians have been thrown in jail since the 2013 election that challenged the ruling party's majority. China has said that the health of the Taiwanese people is not being put at risk by Taiwan's inability to attend a UN health meeting this year. This after Taiwan accused Beijing of obstructing its efforts to attend the May 22nd to 31st annual meeting in Geneva. At the core of the strained ties is the one China policy that Taiwan's new leader refuses to accept. Taiwan is still sending a delegation to the meeting even though it does not have an invitation warning China that attempts to exclude it could irreversibly damage ties. Security forces clashed with opposition protesters in the western Venezuelan state of Tachira as a wave of protests against the government of President Maduro entered its sixth week. Opposition uh, protesters are demanding that political prisoners be released, a humanitarian channel be opened for food and medicine. Instead, Maduro has called the Constituent Assembly to rewrite the Constitution. Well, let's now shift focus and bring you up to speed with some sports news in Sports Beat. Indian fast bowler Jhulan Goswami has become the highest female wicket taker in the history of ODIs. She broke the decade long record held by Australian Catherine Fitzpatrick. Jhulan Goswami dismissed South Africa's uh, Raisipi Tozake in the ODI to claim her 181st victim in the 50-over format. Jhulan achieved her feat in her 153rd match. She also has 40 wickets in 10 tests and 50 wickets in 60 T20 internationals. Juventus beat TS Monaco 2-1 as uh, defender Dani Alves scored a stunning volleyed goal that took the Italians into their second Champions League final in three years. 
Juventus, who won the first leg 2 0, were coasting until Kylian Mbappe pulled one back in the 69th minute. Juventus will now face either Real Madrid or Atletico Madrid in the other semi final on Wednesday. Andy Murray and Dominic Thiem progress to the Madrid Open third round after comfortable wins over unseeded opponents. Murray beat a Romanian Marius Kopil 6-4-6-3, who just moved into the top 100 in the world rankings for the first time in his career. Austrian Thiem beat American Jared Donaldson 6-3-6-4. Murray will now face Croat Borna Koric or Frenchman Pierre Hughes in the last 16. Well, that's it on this newscast. Have a good evening.